Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's speaker series here at Utah State University. We're going virtual and live from Logan. And before we get started, I just wanted to point everyone's attention to today's Slido code. If you go to Slido, you can enter hashtag Canyon House. It's in the chat bar as well. And this is an opportunity to both uh, give your attendance, but also for a very interactive Q&A that we will be hosting at the end of today's lecture. So please join us on Slido and ask any questions you have of our guests today. Today we also have a sponsor. Uh, today's lecture is sponsored by Blockholt Boutique. They are a residential design studio based in Park City, Utah. Their typical projects are large residential estates and they serve their clientele with an eye to grounding a family legacy to place by providing regional ecological expertise in geology, hydrology, soil science, botany, wildlife, climate, horticulture, and agriculture. Their timeless landscape designs are behind some of the nouveau agricultural estates developing in the Mountain West. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague and mentor, uh, Todd Johnson, to introduce today's speakers. Thanks, Danielle. Um, and thanks, everybody, for attending uh, this, I believe, the third in the series this fall of the speaker series uh, in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning. And uh, it's uh, normally the speakers are introduced by by Danielle. And uh, in this case, um, we have two speakers that I've known for 40 years, Jean and Dorothy Dyer, and they have extremely distinguished careers in journalism, education, architecture, uh, nationally and globally. I met them in 1980 at Harvard University uh, in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Design. And uh, they were extremely gracious in asking me to, to uh, give a presentation of work that we did in 1983 in Jerusalem, uh, spending a year working on the reunification of the city. No small task. Um, I have been uh, professional and family friends. We've shared experiences uh, among our families and with our children and uh, visiting places and looking at uh, landscapes with the likes of J.B. Jackson and other people. And they are uh, extraordinary students of design, teachers of design and practitioners of design. So it's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce Jean and, and Dorothy Dyer. Thank you, Todd. Great to talk with you and to have some time to spend with you as well as your amazing students. Good afternoon, everyone. Dorothy and I are honored to be invited to participate in the Pune workshop here at Utah State University. When Caroline and Todd first spoke to us about the invitation, they suggested we present an overview of our work with an emphasis on scale, a scale change of projects in terms of big and small. Although we have spent many years in school as both students and teachers, we do not think of ourselves as academics, but as practitioners. As you may have surmised by now, we have practiced for over 50 years. We represent several generations of professional experience. It is this unique range of experience that we felt like that we had the most to offer. However, we realized early on that we would have to pare down the number of projects to something that could be reasonably absorbed in a single session. In sorting through a lifetime of work, we chose six different projects that we thought would best represent our work. The project you see above is our largest project to date, our largest single project. This project is probably the smallest one we have to date and is currently under construction at our home in New Mexico. The project I really want to start with, however, is Maudine, a new city that is designed and under construction and being built in Maudine, Israel. It started in 1981 and is still in progress. Moshe Safdie Architects in Boston 
are the design architects. Maldine in size and occupancy is in fact the largest project, but it is not actually a single project, but a city started from scratch that is being built incrementally over time. The political story behind the creation of this project is interesting. Israel by this time, as you may be aware, had built numerous residential neighborhoods in the occupied West Bank under the influence of previous prime ministers. Under a new prime minister, Itzhak Rabin, Israel reversed its, its policy and the construction of the West Bank was suspended and a strong political emphasis and funding was given to building the new city of Maudin. Maudin is located approximately halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and built entirely within Israel proper. The sketch shown here is an early conceptual sketch I did to explore the idea of using the hill and the valley river valley topography as a primary zones of circulation containing a river and landscape and neighborhood support. The hillside became the medium to develop the hillside housing between the top and the bottom of the hills. This is an early styrofoam and clay study model. It is investigating the potential use of the river valleys as open space, circulation, and neighborhood services and uses. Our early on-site investigations, we noted that the topography throughout the beautiful valley was even and uneventful. The hill valley system was very even and did not provide distinguishing landscape features and landmarks as placemaking and wayfinding. It was therefore decided to study the hilltops not only as open space, but as sites for providing unique buildings and structures. As physical features, that would provide location and wayfinding and a sense of the city identity. This is an early sketch I did after the team understood and absorbed some of the lessons from the physical model. This sketch is more precisely investigated the physical nature of neighborhoods and open space edges, the flow and shape and usage of vehicular and pedestrian movement. The flow and confluence of the river valley was open space systems, helped to define the location of the town center. The north-south ridge defines the north-south primary circulation and entry. A wadi, a drainage system, wadi anaba, defines the east-west circulation, including train access and city entrance from the west. The valley circulation became a one-way pair system at the valley edges with a secondary collector system crossing the valleys and over the hills and ridges to form a distorted connecting bridge and grid throughout the entire city. Dedicated pedestrian systems connected the valley floor space with the open spaces at the ridges. This is a computerized version of the earlier hand sketch that you saw in the previous slide. The gray portion in the middle is the first phase of Maudin. Maudin is designed for the occupancy of 250,000 people. The gray area which is built and occupied at this point houses 100,000 people. This is the gray area, phase one, is the area covered by the previous hand sketch. The principal set first in the first phase are extended to the entire city of 8,000 acres. However, in further by study by the National Planning Authority study, it has been deemed by the median, that the medium density of Maudin phase one is too low. And the second phase needs to accommodate a much higher density of building types. This planning directive is currently under study and including a second city center. 
This sketch is one that describes the hillside study for housing types that develop different densities in street edge and open space patterns. The lower edge located in this location is the bottom of the valley. The upper edge is the top of the hillside. And both of these are left blank in this study to let us understand what the patterns of the hillside housing would become. This is studies of different types of housing. And these particular housing types are designed for medium to a, a little bit higher slope on the edge of the hills. The housing type investigates low to medium slope topography. They were developed with a premium on views, terraces, balconies, gardens, and cross ventilation. The valley edge types and the higher densities required below grade structured parking. This is a larger study, computerized study of a number of neighborhoods. The entire hillside neighborhood residential patterns were developed with circulation, uses, and pedestrian patterns across entire neighborhood boundaries. One-way pair valley roads with crossed pairs of acting as square roundabouts. Secondary connector pairs act together with valley roads to pair to form a connective grid from neighborhood to neighborhood. Pedestrian open space over hill and valley were connected by and pedestrian walkways and stairways. The valleys are shown undeveloped here without landscape purposefully in this drawing. In Valley 16 in this location, if you can follow my uh, cursor, this is Valley 16 as we called it, is the same valley that I'm going to show you in this next slide. So you're seeing in this case, not the hillside housing, but the develop, development of the valleys itself in the pattern of a river. This drawing is the negative counterpoint to the previous slide and excludes residential hillside develop and focus on the valley as a typical valley pattern concept. It's designed to create dense neighborhood uses and landscape planning at the narrows, areas just like the narrows in a river or rapids in a river, where the river pattern widens as it were a stilling basin in a river, the planting patterns are more open and left to grass and more passive and sports-like activities. This is an overview from an aerial perspective of a river valley. In this case, the planting is very immature and undeveloped. The cornice lines that you can see here rise from the tops of the hill at about four floors and at the heads of the valleys they gain about two or three more floors to about six or seven, even sometimes eight, as the valley descends to the town center. Corners at major cross streets are articulated to indicate urban gateway expressions. Facades along the street hold a common setback line. Building entrances have emphasis at each building. First floor is raised approximately one half floor above the sidewalk level on a retaining wall planters for privacy at that floor. This is a hand sketch early on that describes and investigated some of the components of the town center itself. It's a pastel sketch that starts to explore and define major urban features. A large roundabout located in this area is a primary urban plaza and open space. The roundabout is also a multimodal transportation hub with a train station, a bus station, taxis, and parking. The primary north-south road flows through the roundabout at a lower level and primary allows access through the roundabout without having to circulate the upper levels. The valley streets flow into the city center to form a rectangular grid. A shopping romblas located in this area, if you could follow my 
pointer along this line is a rhomblos that is highly landscaped shopping street with intense pedestrian activity with high-end retail offices, locations for institutional corporation headquarters. This is a clay model that describes the desired mass mass massing and the spatial patterns that were sensitive to trying to preserve the views. This is a computer model which indicates the urban character for the city plaza, a roundabout, a transportation center with access to open space of Vadi Anaba. Now Vadi Anaba is the green space that you see in front of you and it's a large natural valley that flows all the way from Maudin to the Mediterranean Sea through the city of Maudin and Tel Aviv. The transportation center contains a train station, bus station, both for inner city and intra-city buses, a taxi station, both for long distance and shared taxis and local taxis, as well as parking. Pedestrian access from the urban streets in the down center to urban plazas, to transportation centers, to Audubon, Wadi Anaba and open space, and ultimately to Tel Aviv. This is an open space park at the head of a valley system and along a ridge. Landscaping, of course, is immature in this ind indication. Another valley view with landscaping and open space and street indicates the right-hand side is downhill traffic of the one-way pair at a street edge with on-street parking and pedestrian sidewalk. Passive activities occur in the open space in the middle of the parklands. This is a view looking uphill on a valley street with a sparse tree planting, landscaping at a major open space area. If you consider the river valley open space, the planted neighborhood parks, the archeologically preserved open space, urban plazas and open space, and the space of Vadi Anaba, Maudine will have approximately 50% of its land coverage as open space. A large landscape valley in this case is large enough to provide a middle school in the middle of the valley. Pedestrian ways from hilltop to valley floors were highly landscaped. This shows a low slope pedestrian way, pedestrian way on a much steeper slope. And this pedestrian way on a very steep slope, some of these were as high as 45 degrees. This is a playground area, a piece of art. And these were very popular in the neighborhoods and primarily dotted themselves throughout the river valleys. This next project we would like to look at is located in the Punjab in India and is a direct commission to Moshe Safi Associates from the minister of the Punjab province in India. The design started in 1998 and was constructed and completed in 2011. The project is located in a small remote village, Anandpur Saab, and is an agricultural region near the base of the Himalayan mountains in the Punjab of India. It is comprised of 250,000 square feet of museum a memorial building and is dedicated to the Sikh culture on a site of about 75 acres. This is an aerial photograph of Anandpur Saab, which is, a, as I mentioned, a very small rural sacred village north of Chandigarh. It is sacred because of a fort where a famous guru or a holy one was martyred in battle. A guru at the other end is located along an access. It's used for feeding, for study, and for prayer and feeding and administration for the Sikhs. Continuing, the fort and the Godwara is a grand processional access used only on holiday and holy events and other occasions. The selected site crossing a, a dry wash is a beautifully forested hill near the fort. This is a hand sketch that I did early on to try and understand the uh, makeup of the land 
and the processional access, the historical fort, the entrance to the physical center, stepped reflecting ponds using a dry wadi that does have flow during the monsoon or the rainy season, an arch bridge with a midway viewing area and a small cafe, visitors parking and museum entrance from the west, a memorial space in Sikh culture, vertical floral museum galleries, historical stepped museum galleries. These are computer generated elevations. The structural materials for the exterior walls were cast in place concrete covered with Rajasthan sandstone. The roof is a stainless steel roof, which was sheeted and rolled, especially in a toroidal basis in Australia. This is a view of the historical fort where the sacred one Guru was martyred to the newly constructed Halsa Memorial complex in the background. Groundbreaking ceremonial, a procession for the Holy Ones was performed on the days of the daybreak of the groundbreaking. Three of the horseback gurus are shown here. Over 1 million Sikhs were in, intended, were in, in attendance for the groundbreaking, including a small contingent of American Sikhs from an ashram in Espanola, New Mexico, about 75 miles from our home. We thought it was particularly amazing coincidence to run across people we recognize from home in a crowd of over a million people halfway around the world. A view, aerial view of the finished facility showing the stepped reflecting ponds and the bypass sleuth for continuous flooding. You didn't see this particular configuration of the ponds in the earlier drawings, but the ponds from the right to the left step up in one half meter increments for about five meters. Along this edge, now those ponds stay clear, but this is a dry wadi that runs in the rainy season and does flash flood from time to time. To prevent the ponds from becoming diluted and, and, and uh, overburdened with silt, we ran a sluice along this side of the ponds. You can see it if you really squint at it. There's a line that parallels kind of a rough edge on this side. And that's a sluice that bypasses the reflected ponds with runoff water. This is a close up of the reflective pond showing a memorial, uh, the memorial pavilion and the arch bridge along with the reflecting pools. This is an exterior view day and night of the ponds and the galleries in the background. The two shown uh, interior views are the interior views of the memorial, memorial pavilion. This is an, another existing city in the city of Akko, which Dorothy worked on and spent a good deal of time working with an Israeli architect. And I would like to give the, the podium over to Dorothy to talk about this particular project. I just hit that to switch. Uh, this is the existing city of Akko. Throughout history, Akko has been an important city port located at the northern end of the Haifa Bay in north of Israel. The Crusaders, after being thrown out of Jerusalem in the late 12th century, moved the Crusader Kingdom to Akko and refortified the walls and the ports which they had built earlier. This last period of the Crusaders in the Holy Land ended in 1291 with the conquest by the Turkish Mamelukes. This slide shows the main port at Akko today, once used to bring supplies from Italy and other European cities to Crusader Akko. Today, it's a pleasure boat port geared towards tourism and existing city cultural events. Local wed weddings often take place on the boats and in the caravan Sarais, which is the large square building that you see behind. This is just a, a simplified map of uh, Israel and the 
black box above is where Akko is located at the, uh, at the Hypa Bay. The uh, northern gray area is uh, Lebanon. The striped area in the north is the Golan Heights. The large striped area in the middle is Palestinian Western Jerusalem. And the one, the striped area along the coast is, is, is the Gaza. To the left is Egypt, to the right is Saudi Arabia. I went the wrong way, I think. Um, I worked three years with Israeli architect Arye Rahamima on the restoration plan of Akko. This drawing shows the wall city area included in the plan. There are five caravan sarais in the city. These merchant quarters accommodated the Italian maritime sailors and their crews who supplied the Crusader kingdoms with goods and European luxuries. The photo shows a view of the inside of one of the caravan sarais. The plan called for the restoration of the underground Crusader night city and the restoration of the existing Turkish city above with a tourism plan to include both upper and lower cities. One of the important things that we looked at it in this plan was the existing remains of a Crusader ship port on the eastern side of Akko. The plan called for a new tourism hotel to be located on these remains. We prepared a conceptual plan for the Knights Hotel on the remaining Crusader foundations. The hotel would accommodate pleasure boats docking within the hotel water space. This is a sketch Jean did. Constructed during Crusader times, a series of water tunnels brought ships and goods safely inside the walled city. This was a sketch of the proposed restoration and repurposing of old as well as new buildings at the upper city's entry walls. This reuse would accommodate local and international tourism activities, including museums, hotels, restaurants, commercial, and some special housing. This is a, a model showing the original Crusader Knights Kingdom. When the Turks conquered Akko from the Crusaders, they tore down and partially or completely buried most of the Crusader city and built on top. Significant remains were uncovered in the 1950s and 60s. And in the 1990s, excavations and the master plan was undertaken. We worked in conjunction with the archeologists and were sponsored by the Israeli Antiquities Authority and the Israeli Planning Commission. An informational conceptual sketch to show the underground crusader vaults below the new Turkish city built above. During excavation, many almost untouched vaults and walls were discovered and the de debris removed. This photo shows some of the excavated crusader vaults below and the new Turkish city built above. This is some of the entrances to the underground city. The new city construction was very, is very visible in this site. This shows part of the excavated and restored underground Crusader city. This large room is called the Knights Hall and is president, presently a museum. The gentleman facing the camera is architect Rahamimov, who I work with on the project. In the Turkish upper city, a part of our plan was to develop commercial activities. A typical Mid-Eastern market, or souks as they were called, was completed during reno renovated Turk using renovated Turkish buildings, as well as new construction additions. This new market has been completed only a few years ago and is extremely popular both with tourists and with locals. Another view of the newly developed city market in Akko and its many colorful activities. This is a drawing I did of buildings in the upper city that were to be renovated around one of the main plazas called Ottoman Square. There were several, several building types. The large three to four story building in the center was called a palace house where the wealthy merchants lived. Akko contained many of these large houses. The main fabric of the city were stone, were stone vaulted residential buildings, many accommodated commercial on the ground level. 
This was a conceptual drawing of restoration plans for the buildings in Ottoman Square. The palace hotels contain beautiful ornate windows as well as painted ceilings and walls. We were able to document and save most of these ornate windows and details that were particular to the Akko palace houses. Here we show a drawing I did as we sought to document and restore these housing details. As mentioned, the main fabric of the town was vaulted two to three story stone residential buildings and the plan call for the restoration and upgrade of these houses, which included much of the town fabric. The plan also accommodated in zoning regulations, some modern day additions on rooftops to extend living spaces for large families. Another photo of the palace windows is seen here, restored tile work and a view of the two main mosques in Akko, the green and blue mosque, which is fairly obvious. Several of the old palace houses were incorporated into the Akko Hotel. The original detailing on the ceiling was restored and then special windows brought back. Lower floors on these palace houses were 18 feet tall. A better view of the restored palace windows. This is the reading room at the Akko Hotel. In a success story, most of the plan has been implemented. Housing continues to be restored and the Knights Hotel is being planned. Akko has proven a great local and tourist attraction both with the modern upper city restoration and its new attractions, as well as the fascination and importance of the historical underground crusader city. As a result of this plan, Akko was designated a world heritage city. This is the Damascus Gate Seam Project, known as the No Man's Land. It is very special to us. As we worked for a year in Jerusalem, Israel with one of your own USU professors, Todd Johnson. The project backed by Harvard University sponsored three fellows. The goal was to knit together the politically estranged Arab East, East Jerusalem and the Jewish West Jerusalem. The project was awarded the first award in urban design by Progressive Architecture in 1985. We'd like to share this project with Todd and have him come speak to the plan. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, yeah, this is a, I guess, a, a, a comment about um, the opportunities that come. Um, if you want to go back to the first one, Dorothy. Back to the first one? Back first image, yeah. Uh, opportunities that come from school and you meet people like Gene and Dorothy and you engage in projects in the studio and those projects end up turning into travel and um, projects of the significance of the uh, Damascus Gate project. So what we're talking about here is a year long um, residency in Jerusalem working essentially on the triangle area, but when you work with architects who embrace uh, contextualism and embrace the history of the landscape and the relationship of landscape and buildings, you get the opportunity to kind of cross fertilize the professions. And Jean and Dorothy, certainly, as you can see from the projects that they've shown to this point, uh, embrace the idea that it's a multidisciplinary uh, experience and, and there's a lot to be learned from each other. And I learned a tremendous amount from uh, Gene was the team leader on this project. And uh, I, I guess it goes without saying that some people can draw from the age of seven or so. And I, I put Gene in the category of someone who was born with a pencil in his hand. <laughs> Ouch. Um, <laughs> and uh, so what we were working on was a triangle. It was actually the dividing area between uh, East and West Jerusalem. So when I was uh, 10 or 12 years old, I would watch the news and there were people shooting across a barrier that an imaginary line drawn north from Damascus Gate. Um, and between 1948 and 1967, um, Israelis and Jewish people did not have access to the old city. So everything on the right hand of this slide was Jordan, including all of the old city. In 1967, the Israelis stormed the south end of the city at a gate called Dung Gate at the bottom of that one kilometer square old city. 
and took over the city. Um, the mayor uh, was a Viennese man um, named Teddy Kolick, and he was our client. Um, the goal was to um, responsibly reunify East Jerusalem and Palestinian populations and communities with West Jerusalem, Israeli and Jewish communities. And so we spent the entire year engaging with both populations, making presentations to um, those separate community groups. And I think if you ever wanna learn anything about stakeholder engagement, um, go to a place that has uh, several thousand years of hate and animosity and, and also um, several thousand years of cooperation. You know, it, it went from periods of intense uh, antagonism to intense cooperation. Um, next slide. Um, we did these drawings really in the last month of, of the year that we were there. So with mountains of trace paper and thousands of hours of meetings, sometimes two hour long meetings that were conducted in some combination of Hebrew and Arabic. Um, we finally sat down to the drawing table and uh, and Jean and I both were um, committed to taking the full last month and drawing everything by hand. So these drawings were about six feet tall and they started with existing conditions on the left. There's nothing like drawing a six foot tall by two and a half foot wide drawing of every existing building to understand how those streets and systems work. But we were essentially responsible for a corridor extending from the top of this drawing down to Damascus Gate, which you can see um, the main gate from the north. Uh, the proposals at that time were for a major six lane highway to extend all the way through. And actually certain proposals had suggested tunneling under the, co the corner of the old city to connect Nablus in the north eventually Damascus to Bethlehem in the south. And so we immediately were um, uh, contrary to that idea, suggested that the road needed to address the surrounding landscape and to compress to become something more small and intimate with an entire uh, mixed use urban design plan and public space plan uh, organized around Damascus Gate. So on the left is what we looked at when we got there, a no man's land, a land that had been bombed out and shot across. You would call that a soft zone and disintegrated portions of the city on either side of it. And what you see on the right is our um, proposal to reestablish uh, healthy communities, Palestinian and Israeli, and to get them to join um, at primarily a transportation bus station buried under shops and museums and public plazas. Next. Next slide, Dorothy. Oh, I, I have it up. This is uh, then the culminating space. So one of the great urban, the urban design lessons, Gene and I smile, Moshe Safdie was in Boston at the time and we were sending sketches back and forth. And there is a street called uh, Hanavim Street that is the diagonal street from the upper left-hand side down to Damascus Gate on the lower right-hand side. And we had a program for major buses from the East and West Banks. Um, and those buses were the primary place where Israelis and Palestinians met. And so we crowded those buses around that street and Moshe sent us a, a scathing critique and said, <laughs> so they should be pushed down onto the public plaza that moves then into Damascus Gate in order to unify the two halves. We started to develop the use and levels. There are many topographic levels in this plan, but 
but it is essentially a major museum on the left-hand side, a major public plaza that allows people to view the Great Wall of the Old City and a focus on bringing indigenous worshipers and goods and services in and out of Damascus Gate. Um, we were highly concerned about contemporary tourism um, conflicting with the spiritual and, and pilgrim, the desires of, of uh, worshipers and pilgrims and everyday people from East and West Jerusalem. You can see the, um, the old city is about, um, it's about 4,000 years old. The Jerusalem as a whole is about five and a half to 6,000 years old. The reason that Jerusalem is a very special place is because Abraham was confronted with the sacrifice of one of his sons, Isaac, on a rock called the Dome, Dome of the Rock. And so the three Abrahamic faiths, the Judaic faith, um, the Muslim faith, and the Christian faith all hold Muhammad as uh, a core prophet. And the reason for the conflict is that they all strive to come back to that one point on the rock and uh, secure it for their own worship. Next slide. As I say, I think Jean could draw from the age of 10. Um, so um, we had lots of conversations with pencils and ink, and um, we had lots of conversations about what the appropriate architectural style is. This is looking back from Damascus Gate at the major museum, which is a, a combination of contemporary forms and historic forms layered together. The whole idea was to get the uh, neighborhood that's about 150 years old on the hillside, which is made up of major global institutions of the last 150 years to get that to cascade down into this major public market space. The bus station is buried under the buildings on the right. And so all of those are markets, informal markets with Palestinian women with dates and figs and things strewn on the plaza and then more formalized coffee shops and restaurants above with a, a very tamed street coming through very pedestrian oriented and a bus station underneath. Next, next. So this is the prize. The, um, the yellow uh, rectangle is the Temple Mount. That is a precinct of uh, the Islamic faith, the Muslim faith. The Palestinians are in charge of that, the Wailing Wall that is sacred to the Jewish um, commitment and desire to um, return to the city and pray uh, closely to the point of the Dome of the Rock is the Wailing Wall, which is that little square down in the lower left-hand corner. The city is divided into quarters, Armenian, Jewish, Armenian, Christian, and Muslim. And so um, our study was sympathetic to uh, integrating the contemporary uh, community of East and West Jerusalem into the old city. It's about 25,000 people live inside a one kilometer square area. The wall around the outside was built by Suleiman, uh, who was an Ottoman uh, emperor in about sometime in the 17th century. The form of the city, every major empire builder from the time of Alexander the Great to Napoleon have coveted the city and come and came and reshaped the city in various forms. And last, we have just a few sketches um, of the imaging, imagery of individual places. So the sketch, um, Above is a sketch looking back at Damascus Gate. Uh, behind where you see the gate entering the portal called Damascus Gate is the tomb of Mount Walls were built from stone that was extracted from those quarries in the lower right-hand co uh, corner sketch. And the sketch on the lower left is of the prioritization of getting goods and services into Damascus Gate to keep it a thriving indigenous um, connection. 
and there's one more sketch. So the project was really about finding a way to unify um, Israelis and Palestinians and to use transfer architecture and urban design and landscape architecture could create uh, an appropriate uh, reunification of the city. The mayor at that time was as committed to an integrated future as anyone has ever been. Um, our experience working there was not only a, a, a great and wonderful experience for me working with Gene and Dorothy, but also working with the mayor and other leaders of Israel in order to, to help uh, initiate and further the conversation of how the integration of, of those people could happen. So it was an amazing opportunity. Thanks, Gene and Dorothy, for letting me <laughs> reminisce. Thank you. It, it was fun to reminisce with you. <laughs> Let's see. OK, we're moving on to what, in the very beginning, we talked about as our biggest project, the largest project. We're moving from large to small. This project to date is the, new, is the Marina Bay Sands Integrated Resort in Singapore. It re represents Softy's office. Dorothy and I lived in four years for four years in Singapore while completing this project. I acted as the project director and Dorothy managed the office by which one time included about 26 architects relocated from Boston. The Softy office had a project design staff that expanded from three to eight, 38, spent six months and $1 million on the design for this competition. An additional six months Sorry, we're not, we're not getting this right. An additional six months were used to initiate the design development drawings. Dorothy and I then started a relocation program in part in, in moving the office or 26 people from the office in Boston to Singapore. Ultimately, the staff, MSA staff were embedded into a local Singaporean office of ADIS architects working with a team of about 250 architects. It took four years and over $5 billion to complete the construction. The project was created as a developer architect competition sponsored by the Singaporean Tourism Board and the Urban the Redevelopment Authority, the URA. After a year long competition, four competitors submitted schemes. The Softy team used six months for the competition. The site was a 30 acre site of reclaimed land from the sea. The site was in a prominent location on the peninsula on Marina Bay. The development team of Las Vegas Sand, Sheldon Agles Adelson and Moshe Softy Architects were the winners of the competition and a 66 year land lease secured the site. A very strict and well thought out set of urban design lines were presented to the developers by the URA. This is an overview of a 57 story high, 150 feet long infinity edge swimming pool as the main feature of the sky park. This is a view, an aerial view of the entire 30 acre integrated resort. Along the waterfront was a URA mandated pedestrian promenade with a 5,000 square meter public plaza in the midway. On the promontory was also a URA mandated iconic institution. Both the promenade and the institution were to be designed and built by the developer team and then given as a gift to the city of Singapore. The long curvilinear canopy structure in the is the retail gallery with over 1 million square feet of high-end retail, including a major food court and an ice skating rink. The three curvilinear roofed buildings represented from left to right, two Broadway style theaters. The middle building is a casino 
with a thousand gaming tables and five celebrity chefs. The building to the right is the mice or the layman in layman terms, a convention center comprised of M for meetings, I for uh, entertainment and so forth. This is a view of the Marina Bay Sands with the Singapore Botanical Gardens by the bay in the foreground designed by the English landscape architect, Grant Associates. It's really a great project. And for those who you may not have seen it, it should be reviewed in your journals. The upper left image in this slide is the vortex water feature designed by California artist, Medcom. It is a $10 million art institution installation of a three inch plexiglass vortex formed in Japan and chemically welded together into a single piece on site. This was a number, was one of a number of major art installations totaling $52 million for which the developer was awarded additional building area as a bonus. The lower left image is the retail gallery of over 1 million square feet of high-end retail. Celebrity chef, Dining areas overlook the mall to the downtown towers of Singapore. The convention center, the casinos, and the theaters all opened up to this gallery. This is a seaside view as a gateway, Marina Bay Sands as a gateway to the Marina Bay itself, with an iconic sky park in downtown Singapore in the background. The construction of the Sky Park was very interesting. This is a photo showing two of the major elements for the construction of the observation cantilever being lifted. The two pieces, one on either side of the tower, weighed 100, 350 tons in a combination and were lifted at the same time on each side of the tower to distribute the weight vertically. This is the lifting apparatus brought from Japan called a strand jack system and used in Japan largely for bridge building. It took 14 hours to lift this load to the top of the tower. The contractor set up a small weather station at the top of the tower to monitor the winds to prevent the load from hitting the tower. The structural member has an interior rooms with access panels and large enough access for a person to stand. This is the finished pedestrian promenade that was required by the Singapore's URA. The large pedestrian way was designed by PWP, P. Peter Walker and the Partners and MSA and was constructed by the developer and given over to the city of Singapore for continued programming and maintenance. The landscaping was designed again by PWP was a major project with a cost of over $10 million in plant material. The plant material was sourced by PWP from all over Southeast Asia, relocated to a holding and acclimation farm near the project. Most of the material was held at the farm for a period of approximately two years, well until it was acclimated and then moved to the site of the project as was scheduled for final transplanting, transplanting. This is a shot of the transplanting of the royal palms that were the primary plant used at the pedestrian promenade itself. It should be noted that the entire reclaimed site of 30 acres was fully excavated to a depth of 18 meters to accommodate project program below grade. This means that there was no mother earth for landscaping. All the landscaping was planted in structured concrete boxes. The landscaping planting, planting at the Sky Park, 57 stories in the air. The portion of the Sky Park between the two towers is structured as a bridge with movement joints designed to accommodate up to 30 centimeters of differential movement of the towers. This also meant that the 150 foot long infinity swimming pool also had two joints to accommodate the same movement. This is a view, view of the retail garden, retail gallery with a protected skylight with views of downtown Singapore across the bay. 
A very important and popular part of MSA's work in Singapore was Dateline Singapore. This was a newsletter published each Friday and distributed to staff and interesting associates of each MSA office. For many of the staff, this was a long awaited event of each week. I would like Dorothy, the inspiration and driving force of Dateline Singapore to say a few words. We documented the progress of the project on a weekly basis by sending out Dateline reports of the construction, as well as the social activities that took place among us. At the end of the project, we had compiled three large books with the documentation of the beginning and the completion of Marina Bay Sands. An example of the social happenings was when Bollywood Academy Awards came to the Marina Bay Sands to celebrate and give out their Oscars. I have to say Hollywood has nothing on Bollywood. Their actors and dancers and performers were magnificent. It was truly a night to be remembered. I do have a fun story about the documenting of the social events. When we first arrived in Singapore, I started the Dateline weekly reports to keep the Boston office informed of our activities and the project. Needless to say, when we first arrived, we were paying attention to housing, learning the city, touring the, touring the site, and eating in Singapore's world-renowned restaurants. When Moshe made his first trip to visit his new office in Singapore, he took me aside and gently, but firmly admonished me that Dateline was about the construction of Marina Bay Sands. He said it looked like we were having too much fun in Singapore and doing too little work. I understood what he meant. And of course, therefore, and afterwards, I documented the project. However, when something as exciting and wonderful as Bollywood came to Marina Bay Sands, I documented it. Um, I didn't get reprimanded for the rest of the project, so I assumed it was okay. We have seen the big projects, the medium, and some in between. Now let's take a look at the smallest project we have ever attempted, a tractor truck storage shed. We had originally really wanted to build a chicken house, but on second thought, we decided we really didn't want chickens. Thus, the tractor truck storage shed evolved. Our largest project, as we mentioned, was Marina Bay Sands, which was 10 million square feet. And our smallest to date is the tractor truck shed. It comes in at 128 square feet. So we're gonna leave you this evening with our motto. Think big, appreciate the small, understand both and design appropriately. Thank you for letting us come and share this with you. Thank you, Jade and Dorothy. Um, I'm sure Danielle will come in and uh, ask for questions that might occur. We want to see the finished pictures of the shed. I know. <laughs> They're under construction. The shed is still under construction. <laughs> we like construction shots. We're still, wor we're still working on the budget. <laughs> I have a question if it's not if it's okay to ask. Mm -hmm. we Please, um, Carolyn. You have beautiful drawing, uh, Jean, and I would love if you could uh, expand or talk about the importance or about your process of hand drawing and the creative process of design. Well, what, what the drawings you saw largely here were sort of finished, uh, not necessarily renderings, but sketches. They started with in the same way that almost all architects or landscape architects start with a drawing with yellow trace and really rough kinds of drawings, sometimes with just uh, uh, just charcoal 
and, and pastels. Moshe's office actually used two different approaches to early on conceptual work. One was with the physical model and the others were with just really rough sketches, sometimes all, almost un understandable. But they evolved into some of the sketches and, and drawings that you see here, which in the case of particularly Maudine was really to try and understand the physical features of the built environment, the edges, and, and uh, sometimes just a, a wiggly line will uh, give you an edge that you couldn't have expected to achieve any other way. But um, it's, uh, that's about all I could say about that. It's just a methodology. I, I wanna put in one thing. Uh, I don't know, I think a couple of those drawings in the Damascus State Project was Todd's and Todd had absolutely gorgeous drawings too. He's, he must have been born or got the pencil when he was seven or eight at least because his drawings were just as beautiful. And they, the combination of these two doing that project was just uh, incredible. Of course, you've got to remember Todd's about seven or eight years younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 10 or 20 years younger. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jean and Dorothy. What a what a inspiring presentation you shared with us. I want to remind students that you can go to the link that we put in the chat bar on Slido to enter your questions for the Q&A. We do have some great questions up here on Slido, and I'd like to ask you a few of them, if you don't mind. We, we don't mind. We're not quite sure how to find that link. Do we, are we supposed to go to Slido too? Slido? I'll, I'll just... Um, I'll, I'll tell them to you. I'll, I'll ask you and okay. uh, feel free to answer. And if, if you don't like the question, don't answer. <laughs> yeah, just say next. Just, you, you can pass. <laughs> say, get okay. But the most popular question up there is, um, what advice would you give to students that are wanting to pursue work internationally? Well, you, you know, I, I guess I like a lot of architects and, and designers and landscape architects, at a very early age, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And it was a general direction. And it just was one decision after another, it was not a grand plan to do any particular thing. But the schools that I decided to go to uh, through just kind of a decision to how can I better myself? How can I find a better way to learn, to advance? was largely through the schools that I picked. This is one reason I'm so excited about the school that you're using, that you're, you're in here with the uh, University of Utah University, State University is one of the most amazing uh, design schools that I've been, uh, you know, had access to for a long time. But when you go to a school, I went, we went back to New Mexico Military Institute, to New Mexico University of Albuquerque. And ultimately, after about 10 years of, of practice, decided to go back to Harvard. And that was really quite a move. Uh, it was the one year or the one time that I myself was able to actually go to school without, a, well, without having to work my way through. I really enjoyed just going to school. And I met a lot of people. I met Todd, I met Moshe, I met uh, Simon Smithson. And that's, I think, a good, good way to try and advance yourself. Um, well, I, I had a great follow-up question to that. Um, and since you've had experience working with our students all week is, um, what correlations do you see between your work in the senior urban design studio project in Pune, India? Mm. Well, I, I think we had a great experience today. Uh, it was really kind of the first time we got to see some of the actual work rather than just analysis. But some of the students were coming up with ideas, you know, and generating ideas. And, and that was a, a terrific thing. Uh, some of the methodologies they use, their graphics, their sizing, their, uh, their generosity with the movement uh, was exciting to see that they had a natural sort of um, inclivity to 
uh, move in uh, generous and exciting, uh, spontaneous, uh, creative ways. So re reflecting on all these great projects you guys showed us across the world, what's been one of your most um, what's been one of your greatest learning experiences or opportunities and reflecting on these projects themselves, is there anything you would do differently with all the knowledge you've gained? I, I think it's hard to look back over a lifetime like that and say you would do anything differently. I've been entirely happy with it. And I think Dorothy can probably say the same thing. The one thing that I think has really been very rewarding is going to a different place in a different location and learning a different culture and understanding that they don't see same things the way that we necessarily see them aesthetically. Their color systems may be different. Their shapes may be a little different. There's, there's a, a, an entire uh, experience aesthetically as well as cultural to learn from different climates and different uh, locations and different cultures. It was very exciting to understand the world in a very much more a diverse way. Um, okay, and then another question from one of our students. Um, they were curious when you were working in the Middle East, what were some of the challenges that you all faced in project planning or implementation? It seems like um, the project you worked on with Todd was in a very tumultuous area and was proposing great changes. Um, so yeah, what were some of the challenges you faced there that maybe wouldn't be seen in American design? Uh, and can I just go start off with something that's not exactly design, but if you're afraid of being in a place because of the situation sometimes that's going on, um, it takes some courage sometimes to be in these places. And um, for instance, in Jerusalem, if you're afraid of going around a corner and a car blowing up in front of you, you might as well go home because the years that we worked there, we saw all kinds of things. And you have to be careful, of course, like we're having to be careful now with COVID, but you can't be afraid. And the other thing I wanna say, if I don't say another word is, you gotta love going to work every day. You gotta love what you're doing. And that's the most important thing I think that could happen to you, whether you're in a small firm or you're in some big fancy firm, you got to love going and doing architecture and landscape architecture and urban design. I'd, I'd like to add to that to some extent when our team was basically sponsored when we first went over, including Todd and, and a few other people that were students from Harvard. When we first went over, we were seen as being pro-Israeli. And that was a very difficult thing to get over. It took us some time to actually meet Palestinian architects and Palestinian landscape architects. And we were finally able to put a program together where we had speakers and displays and people submitting projects from both sides of that line. And our project, we met with Palestinian architects, we met with Palestinian developers, we met with merchants, and, and we were able to sort of cross that line and enjoy the culture of both communities. In fact, Dorothy worked with, a pal with an architect from uh, the, the uh, Jerusalem side who was a specialist in dealing with uh, cross the border projects which were both Palestinian and Israeli and American participation. Uh, I think you can talk about uh, the project in Nazareth that uh, uh, had uh, 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 projects, architects to, in, in, in all of those areas. I think what he's saying is you have to be open. Your heart has to be open. You have to have an open heart if you're gonna be a good designer, you really do. and the project he's talking about, we had a token Christian, which was me. They called me the token Christian. We had a token Arab and we had a token token Jewish person. And that was our team. And you can't, without an open heart, you couldn't, we couldn't have done that project. We just couldn't have. It takes, it takes an open mind, an open heart 
And if you're talented, like Jean and Todd, then it goes further and further and further. So, but talent comes from inside you. I'd like to also say that the three of those people became some of the best friends and met in some of the best coffee shops and had some of the best food on both sides of the Israeli Jerusalem border. It's, uh, it was a great experience. We loved a lot of people. We met a lot of really wonderful people. Thank you. And what a great note to end on as we are in a climate right now with so many polarizing views and, and sometimes perspectives, we can open our hearts to sharing a lot of values. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you bringing up that point. I want to thank you both for joining us again today. I, I see we're, we're running out of time here. And um, if there's any last comments that, that Todd would like to add, but I also want to direct all of our students to our next presentation, which will be two weeks from today from our very own Professor Carolyn Lavoie. Uh, if you'll join us on November 6th at 3.30 p.m., we'd love to see you again. And any last remarks, Todd, before we, we close this up for the night? Uh, I just want to thank everybody again. Thank you, Julie and Danielle, for organizing this. And thank you so much, Jean and Dorothy, for being our first residents at Canyon House. And yeah, that's amazing. We're looking forward to having more and more practitioners come and stay as Jean and Dorothy are, and for them to come under the conditions that we're all in and enliven our atmosphere is commendable to them. And I think it's also commendable that our department has had the foresight to create the Canyon House Residency Program. So thanks everybody for showing up. This is great, enthusiastic audience. Uh, and all, all have a safe weekend and we'll see you back next week. <laughs>